Hello, Bio220 students, and welcome to Microbiology Online. This little lesson will cover Chapter 7, which is the control of microbial growth. As with most lessons, we'll cover different terminologies, one of which sepsis, which refers to bacterial contamination, and asepsis, which is the absence of significant contamination. Asepsis, aseptic surgeries, are techniques that prevent the microbial contamination of wounds. Now, there is sterilization, which is the removing or destroying and destroying of all microbial life. There are commercial sterilization techniques, such as killing C. botulatum endospores in canned foods, disinfection, which is a technique for destroying harmful microorganisms, and antisepsis, a technique for destroying harmful microorganisms from living tissue. Now, de-germing is a technique for removing microbes from a limited area in particular, such as around my elbow whenever I donate to the Red Cross. Blood-wise, not money. And then sanitation, which involves the lowering of microbial counts on eating utensils to safe levels. Biocide or germicide, which are treatments that kill those microbes. And bacterial stasis, which inhibits, while not killing, but inhibits the growth of microbes. Measuring the actual rate of microbial death. Well, well, what this chart is showing is what this chart is showing is when certain microbes die faster, that typically means that the host is able to respond and survive. Whereas if certain microbes take a long time to kill off it may actually resent, uh, it may act eventually lead to the death of the host. Usually, in the cases of curves, Logarithmic, logarithmic functions are used to represent important information in a linear line. It's a function that helps return values into a straight line, whereas if the face value, such as the original whole amount of surviving cells was represented, it could look as a janky line or curve. Now, the effectiveness of treatment will depend on a few factors, some of which include the number of microbes currently present, the environment, such as the amount of organic matter available, whether or not that microbe produces biofilms, and what temperature they're optimal at. Also, what includes is the amount of time the exposure has happened, or since when the exposure happened, and then microbial characteristics of the actual pathogen as well. Now, logarithmic plotting of microbial death curves reveals that if the rate of killing is the same, it will take longer to kill all members of a larger population than a smaller one, whether using heat or chemical treatments. Essentially, if you're starting with less of one population and it dies at the same rate as having a larger amount of that population, well, it'll take much longer to get rid of the population that started in a larger amount. Now, actions on microbial control agents, these can be alterations of membrane permeability, how well things transfer across membranes, they could be damage to proteins, such as critical enzymes, or damage to nucleic acids that are used for DNA and RNA construction. 
physical methods of microbial control. Well, a very popular one is actually heat. Heat denatures enzymes or important proteins used by microbes. Thermal death point is essentially the lowest temperature at which all cells in a liquid culture are killed within 10 minutes of applying that temperature. Now, thermal death time is the minimal time for all bacteria in a liquid culture to be killed at any particular temperature. which can vary from going from one temperature to the next. There is a characteristic called decimal reduction time, which is the minutes needed to kill 90% of a population at a given temperature. And moist heat sterilization. This is when moist heat denatures proteins. Denature means the unfolding and no longer and making a protein no longer functional. Such processes can involve boiling in water to remove microbes or free flowing stream. Now, instruments called autoclaves use steam under a very high pressure and high temperature to kill off numerous microbes and bacteria and to sterilize many equipment, such as beakers, for biological research. It's effective at killing organisms and endospores on surfaces, but the steam must contact the item surface to be effective. Which is why typically perforated, perforated shelves are used for storing solutions or beakers or glass or that's going to be disinfected allowing heat to go and pass under those glasswares now this involves large containers or i should say the larger the container the longer it takes to sterilize the entire surface and there is types of tape called test strips that are used to indicate sterility. Essentially, they mean that the surface got heated long enough, the tape will actually change or reveal certain lines, which means that the surface heated properly to kill off the microbes. Other ways of using heat include pasteurization, which reduces the amount of spoiling organisms and pathogens in food. They include high temperature, short time factors, which is when a high temperature is applied over a short amount of time, as the name implies. There are thermoduric, but in the case, there are thermoduric organisms that can survive. In the case of dry heat sterilization, this kills by oxidation. Examples include flaming or incineration or using heavily heated hot air to sterilize surfaces. Filtration can also be used to control cell or microbes, microbe growth, such as passing a substance through some mesh and heat sensitive materials are used to help disinfect anything that passes through the mesh. There is high efficiency particulate air filters that can remove microbes over the size of 0.3 micrometers. And then there are membrane filters which can remove microbes above the order of 0.2 micrometers. An example of using some membrane to filter some solution. Now physical methods of microbial control that involve, well there's a 
condition known as lone temperature that has a bacterial static effect, such as refrigeration, deep freezing, or lyophilization, freeze drying, that can sometimes be used to preserve things or bacteria in some stasis or static condition and preventing continued growth. There is high pressure that can be used to denature and unform proteins. A process called desiccation, where water is removed, usually by having a sample on top of a bed of salt, that dries the air in that container and prevents metabolism. And also using factors that increase osmotic pressure, either through dissolved components like salts and sugars, to create a hypertonic environment that causes plasmolysis that dries out the inside of microbes. Radiation can also be used, and of which there are multiple types. There's ionization radiation, which involves X-rays, gamma rays, electron beams, types of radiation that have extremely high amounts of energy. These ionize water to create very reactive radicals that can cause serious damage to DNA and causing even lethal mutations within those microbes. There's non-ionizing radiation using UV light. It's still high energy, but not high enough to cause radicals to form. Even so, it will still damage DNA by creating thiamine dimers, where they, where thiamine nucleic acid base, bases in a strand of DNA that are near each other can pair up, causing kinks in that double strand and preventing the proper replication of that DNA. And also microwaves, which involve lower wavelength, or I should say higher wavelength, lower energy radiation past the infrared scale, involves producing a lot of heat, but they're not necessarily antimicrobial, or they're not, they're not especially for antimicrobial uses. Now, this is just an example of the light spectrum. The visible light spectrum is what we're able to interpret as color. And as we go farther and farther in decreasing wavelength or in increasing energy, we'll get eventually into UV light and then eventually into high energy light, such as that from X-rays and gamma rays that are very excellent at destroying bacteria. Now, principles of effective disinfection. These can involve a wide variety of things, such as concentration of a disinfectant, a particular organic matter, pH level that could be too acidic or basic for any particular microbe, and also time necessary or the amount of time a certain disinfectant is applied. The longer some infectants are applied, the better they become at decreasing a large and larger proportion of an initial microbe population. The use of dilution techniques. Well, these involve metal cylinders that are dipped in test bacteria and then dried. Those cylinders are then placed in a disinfectant for 10 minutes at 20 degrees Celsius. Cylinders are transferred to culture media to determine whether bacteria survive the treatment. Now the disk diffusion method. This evaluates the eff efficacy or efficiency of chemical agents. A filter paper disk is soaked in a chemical and placed on a culture. And then researchers will look for a zone of inhibition around those disks where cell growth is halted and no longer occurring. Now, there are compounds like phenols and phenolics. These can injure the lipids in plasma membranes, thus causing leakage of the internal components of cells into the outside environment. 
And these typically look like what in chemistry are called aromatic compounds. You'll see them typically as groupings of hexagonal units where each corner is a carbon bonded to one hydrogen. And these typically have some alcohol group, which is what is a oxygen-hydrogen functional group. Now, bisphenols, they contain two phenol groups, so two aromatic rings with an alcohol group each. They're connected by some bridge. These can be hexachlorophene or triscosan as two examples. And these are effective at disrupting and ripping open plasma membranes. Such examples can be what are shown on screen, which are connected bisphenols, so two aromatic phenol rings that are heavily chlorinated. There are biguanines, such as chlorohexidine, used in surgical hand scrubs. And these essentially also disrupt plasma membranes, preventing cells from keeping in their contents. Now, halogens are also effective at disinfection. These are elements from the 17th group on the periodic table. And they have a variety of effects. The element iodine, or the chemical iodine, can be used in tincture, which is where there is a solution of aqueous alcohol, or in iodophore, which is combined with organic molecules, and either really helps impair the synthesis and creation of proteins, as well as altering the membranes of microbes. Chlorine, another halogen element, it specializes as an oxidizing agent. It'll shut down cellular enzyme systems and is used in bleach where chlorine Cl is present as hypochlorous acid. It's very effective at disinfecting surfaces when doing bacterial research. There's also another type of chemical called a chloramine, which involves the combination of chlorine and ammonia, NH3. Alcohols can also be used. They're good at denaturing or unfolding proteins and also dissolving lipids, which are what plasma membranes consist of. There is no effect on endospores, however, nor on non-enveloped viruses, viruses that do not have a lipid layer around them. Examples include ethanol and isopropanol, which are typical agents used for cleaning surfaces. Now, they require water in the sense that they need to be dissolved in water to be useful. Now heavy metals can be used as well. These are highly toxic. Oligodynamic action is when a very small amount exerts antimicrobial activity. They are very effective at unfolding proteins to the point where they're no longer functional. Examples include silver, mercury, copper, and zinc. Silver nitrate is used to prevent ophthalmia neonatorum. Mercuric chloride prevents mildew in plants from growing. Copper sulfate is an algicide that kills algae. And zinc chloride can be found in mouthwash. And this is an example of using old buttons or coins made of heavy metals that show a usefulness of acting as a disinfectant or a surface that bacteria and microbes do not effectively grow on, as shown by the zone of inhibition on the microbe, likely on a, under a silver button. Surface active agents, well, these can be things that are found in soaps that are used for degerming or emulsification. Another example could be acid ionizing sanitizers. 
that include anions that react with the plasma membrane of microbes. They can involve quaternary ammonium compound that are called quartz. These are typically quaternary ammonium salts, which form cations, positive ions that are bactericidal. They kill bacteria, they unfold important proteins to microbes, and they disrupt the plasma membrane. A really good triple threat. Now ammonium salts are examples of the ammonium ion shown on the left, NH4+, as well as a quaternary ammonium compound, benzyl alconium chloride, which is present in zephyrum. Both are effective at disinfecting surfaces. Now, this is just a comparison of the effectiveness of various antiseptics. And the effectiveness typically, well, let's look at this. Typically, less and less bacteria survive as these disinfectants are applied with time. Now, the best one here seems to be 1% iodine and 70% ethanol, which is essentially called a tincture of iodine. <laughs> oh boy. Pure soap and water doesn't exactly kill microbes, but it at least does a job of disinfecting common surfaces. Now there is clinical infection or a clinical focus, which is the infection following anesthesia injection. Well, typically having a clean sterile needle will do the good job for that. Chemical food preservatives. These can be sulfur dioxide, which prevents wine from spoiling. It can also involve organic acids that inhibit metabolism such as sorbic acid, benzoic acid, or calcium propionate, which prevent molds in acidic foods, such as fruits or things with fruit juice. There are nitrites and nitrates that prevent endospores germinating. Antibiotics can also be used, which include bactericins, which are proteins produced by one bacterium that inhibits another, another bacteria from growing, also nicin and nanomycin, which prevent the spoilage of cheese. Aldehydes can also be used. These are inactivated proteins that are formed by cross-linking, or these inactivate proteins by cross-linking with certain functional groups in those proteins, such as amine groups, alcohol groups, carboxylic acid groups, and sulfide groups. They're used in preserving specimens and in medical equipment. Examples can be formaldehyde or orthothalaldehyde. Glutaraldehyde is one of the few liquid chemical sterilizing agents. Now, continuing chemical sterilization. There is gaseous sterilants that cause alkylation. This essentially replaces hydrogen atoms of a chemical group with a free radical. And anytime you see radical, these can cause heavy damage to microbe cells. They can cause cross-links in nucleic acids and proteins, basically causing proteins to get connected at points where they're no longer functional or to connect DNA strands causing kinks in the strand so that they're no longer in a shape that enzymes can effectively replicate that genetic material. There's also a use for heat sensitive material, such as ethylene oxide. Now plasma. Where matter can be as far as physical states goes, typically a solid, a liquid, or a gas, there is also the state of plasma, which is essentially ionizing a gas It involves a lot of free radicals that are very effective at destroying microbes very effectively without question. And they can be used for tubular instruments to basically clean the insides and outsides of those tubes. 
since effectively it is a gas, but it's just been ionized to have an extreme amount of energy, so it can flow through things. There are also situations of supercritical fluids. One example being carbon dioxide gas with gaseous and liquid properties that has gaseous and li liquid properties. There's also, and they can be used for medical implants, used for cleaning medical implants. Now, peroxygens and other forms of oxygen. Oxygen, as it says in its own name, is an excellent oxidizing agent. It can be used for, for contaminated surfaces and for food packaging. Forms of oxygen that are deadly include O3, hydrogen peroxide, and also parasitic acid. And then lastly, microbial characteristics for microbial control. This is just a chart that shows a wide variety of chemicals, their effect on endospores, and the effect against mycobacteria. And that concludes this lesson in Chapter 7 on how techniques to control the growth of microbes. Peace out, everyone.